um, for our final talk of the day, uh, we have Tiana, who is a graduate PhD student here at Berkeley um, and heading to Stanford for a postdoc. So uh, we're excited to hear about algorithm and collective action. Michael. Um, uh, so as Michael said, today I'll tell you a little bit about a recent work on algorithmic collective action and machine learning. Um, and this is joint work with Moritz, uh, who's here, uh, Eric Mazumdar from Caltech, um, and Celestine Mendler Dunner from uh, Max Planck in Tübingen. So we all know that online platforms are everywhere around us, and we know that they can have a significant influence over our everyday lives. And what's interesting is that we're seeing an increasing number of examples of people trying to limit or control this influence. So our starting observation today is that we're seeing numerous examples of emerging collectives strategizing against online platforms. So this has been observed in the context of the ride-sharing gig economy. Um, for example, Uber drivers have been observed to coordinate uh, massive app deactivations that would artificially create a dip in the supply of drivers and thus um, activate search pricing. And then once search pricing is activated, they would uh, turn the app back on and enjoy these um, higher prices. Um, something similar has been observed for Didi. So Didi is the Chinese analog of Uber. Um, here it's been documented that up to 40% uh, of Didi drivers use third party apps uh, and bots to manipulate the DD algorithm into uh, giving higher paying rides. Uh, a similar kind of phenomenon is observed in the context of social media. So um, here, Twitter users have been observed to um, coordinate to come up with strategies to um, share and publicly criticize high profile Twitter content that they disagree with, but without um, triggering the algorithmic proliferation of such, of such content. So what they would do is they would uh, take screenshots uh, of these posts that they disagree with, and then they would share screenshots instead of retweeting directly through the app, because retweeting uh, triggers the algorithm into perceiving the content as uh, more popular. And as a final example, we see something similar in the context of traffic navigation. So um, here, there are many cases, um, many documented cases of people fabricating uh, reports of uh, fake traffic accidents in order to uh, deter traffic navigation systems from uh, routing loud, noisy traffic uh, through their uh, local neighborhoods. And so what's interesting to note here is that these online platforms are powered by machine learning, which in turn means that they are powered by data. And this is really what gives these collectives uh, leverage. So collectives use data as a leverage over these online platforms in all of these examples. And so the main question that we'll be uh, trying to address today is what leverage does a collective have over a machine learning uh, powered platform? And so to study this question, we will look at the following mathematical model of the problem. So we will assume that there is an initial population of individuals whose data is sampled from a base distribution P0. And uh, throughout the talk, you should think of, typically think of data points as um, consisting of feature label pairs. Then an alpha fraction of this population joins the collective and the remaining one minus alpha fraction doesn't. So throughout, we will uh, be denoting by alpha the fraction uh, of the population that joins the collective. Now this one minus alpha fraction that doesn't join, they just report their original data, which again was sampled from P0. And the collective applies some kind of algorithmic strategy to uh, craft uh, a new data distribution that we will denote by uh, P star. And then finally, at the end, the platform observes a distribution P that is just a mixture of these two distributions. So P is a mixture where um, alpha fraction of the mixture consists of this distribution P star that was crafted by the collective, and the remaining one minus alpha fraction consists of P zero, which uh, corresponds to the data of the rest of the population. Okay. And so now on the platform side, um, the platform observes this distribution P and uh, runs some learning algorithm A, 
that produces uh, a classifier that we will denote by F. And the collective's goal um, in this setting is to maximize some measure uh, of success that uh, depends on F. So throughout the talk, we will give different examples of what success could mean. But for now, uh, if you want a running example, you can think of one of the examples that I gave at the beginning. For example, a collective will succeed if traffic is not routed um, through their uh, neighborhood. And here, I just want to emphasize that success need not be adversarial to the platform. So the collective does not aim to uh, lower the, uh, the platform's uh, training accuracy or they do not um, aim to uh, minimize their profit. So their uh, measure of success uh, need not be correlated or anti-correlated with, uh, with the platform's goals. And so we'll use this uh, S of alpha notation to denote the success rate that's um, achieved by a collective of size alpha. Okay, so now I'll give a brief overview of the main results. Um, we study three basic learning theoretic settings, um, optimal prediction, convex risk minimization, and possibly non-convex uh, gradient-based learning. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll mainly focus on optimal prediction, and I will give uh, a brief overview of the results on uh, convex risk minimization. In each of these settings, we study uh, natural measures of success, uh, as well as uh, strategies that the collective can implement. And we give lower bounds on the success rate um, for the collective. And what's interesting is that we observe that even small collectives can succeed on machine learning power platforms. So the fact that these people are coordinating can actually give them significant leverage over machine learning powered platforms. Um, and we also run some experiments on um, skill classification tasks that involves uh, freelancer resumes. And these experiments confirm many of the takeaways uh, that we observe in our theory. Okay. So I'll start with optimal prediction. And so first I wanna define what I mean by optimal prediction. So here we assume that the platform deploys the optimal classifier on the observed distribution P where we call the P is this mixture distribution where uh, the alpha, an alpha fraction consists of P star and one minus alpha of uh, P zero. So this is just the base optimal classifier with respect to the zero one loss. And we also allow approximately optimal classifiers in a particular sense. Um, specifically, we'll say that a classifier is epsilon optimal if it is optimal for a distribution that's close to P uh, in TV distance, epsilon close to P. Okay, and so in this setting, we study two goals. Um, so the first goal is planting a signal. The second one is erasing a signal. So this is the formal definition of planting a signal. So we assume that there is some transformation uh, G and the target label Y star. And this is how we measure success. So the way you should think of G as a light transformation to your features, for example, adding some imperceptible watermark to your data or making some slight syntactic changes uh, to your resume. So that's a transformation that you would like to apply uh, to your data at test time. And Y star is the label that you would like to produce um, at that time. So this S of alpha really captures our ability to provoke a target classification uh, at that time. So just to give a cartoon example, let's say that this is my original raw data. If I give the classifier my raw data, the classifier might think that I'm a koala, but maybe if I just apply a slight watermark uh, to my data that says Python, then maybe the classifier will think that I'm actually a software engineer. So, sorry, and what, yeah. what, what are the quantifiers here on G? The G is fixed. So there, but there exists a G such that for all X is... This... No, oh, so I... here I'm looking at the probability where X is sampled from the base distribution. So at that time, I'm assuming that X will be sampled from the same distribution as before. And G is a transformation that the collective agrees on. So we're all saying like, we want classification Y star when we apply this transformation to our data, this fixed G. So you can think about this as uh, at test time, we want as big of a fraction of the test points as possible to get classification Y star when they apply this transformation. 
Um, and now for erasing the signal, this is our goal. Um, so again, we assume that there's a map uh, G and we're basically here saying that we want the classifier to ignore any information that's contained in X, but is not contained in G. So we want the classifier to produce the same prediction if we give it X and if we give it uh, G of X. And again, to give a concrete example, maybe the platform knows that I'm a PhD student, that I'm female, uh, that I do computer science. And now maybe G of X is a transformation of my data where I remove gender. So maybe I want the platform to give me the same prediction um, if, if my gender is uh, removed from the data. So I'll begin with uh, planting a signal. So uh, this is the objective that we defined previously. Um, and in this setting, we consider two strategies. So the first strategy is one where we're allowed to manipulate both our features and labels. So here, given data X, Y, we naturally just report G of X and Y star. So this is the most obvious strategy to correlate uh, G of X and, and Y star. And then the other strategy that we consider is one um, where we assume that the label is maybe uh, difficult to manipulate in some cases. So here we are just uh, changing features. So given data X, Y, we will report for G of X and Y only if Y is equal to Y star. Otherwise we will just uh, report the original data. And here a key parameter uh, in the setting will be the uniqueness of the signal. So we will say that a signal is psi unique if under the base distribution, G of X has measure at most uh, psi. Okay, and so um, these are the definitions that we just saw. So this brings me to the first result that I wanted to state. So we show that using the feature label strategy, the collective uh, acting against an optimal, optimal classifier has a success rate um, that's lower bounded by this expression. And so there's a lot of stuff happening here. So I just wanna decompose the result term by term. So first we see the effect of collective size. So naturally the bigger the collective is, the higher our uh, success rate will be. Then we see uh, the effect of suboptimality of Y star. So if Y star is already optimal on G of X, then this Delta term will just be equal to zero um, and our success will be high. And then the more suboptimal Y star is, the uh, lower our success rate will be as expected. Then we see the effect of signal uniqueness. So the more unique the signal is, the higher our uh, success rate will be. And finally, we see um, the effect of classifier suboptimality. So really what the collective needs in order to achieve success it is it needs the platform to learn. So the collective will carefully craft this data, but it really needs the platform to pick up on the patterns that are in these data points. So if the platform doesn't learn, then obviously the success uh, of the collective will go down. And so if you wanna visualize what this bound looks like, so here we're plotting uh, the success against uh, the size of the collective. On the left-hand side, we uh, show this curve for different values of psi, so of uh, signal uniqueness. And on the right-hand side, we see um, this plot uh, while varying the suboptimality epsilon of the classifier. Okay, so the previous result was about the uh, feature label strategy, and now we can show something similar for the um, feature only strategy. So we have the following lower bound on the success rate, and here really the key parameter is this little p. So p is the minimum probability of seeing uh, y star. And intuitively, the way you should think about this p is requiring p to be large enough, which again, uh, ensures that the success will be large enough, means that there is no overwhelmingly strong signal for a competing label. So we are in trouble if for certain Xs, there is very strong signal for a label that's not equal to Y star. So we need Y star to be sufficiently probable uh, everywhere. So as a takeaway, you can see that signal uniqueness plays a really uh, important role in both of these results. In particular, if the signal 
uh, is unique, then even small collectives can achieve a sufficiently high success rate. Um, and so now I'll show you uh, an analogous result for erasing the signal. So this was the objective that we previously defined. And here we study the erasure strategy. So here given data X, Y, we report X, and then the most likely label given G of X. So in the example that I gave you where we censor some sensitive features, the way you should think about this is that this is the most likely label given your uh, sensor data. Okay, and so we get this lower bound in this setting. So here we have a, a new parameter uh, tau, which intuitively measures how much information is contained in the part of X that's not equal to G of X. So specifically, if the outcome Y is independent of X given G of X, then this tau will just be equal to zero and our success rate will be high. And then the more information is contained in X, uh, with G of X removed, then uh, our success uh, gets lower. Okay, and so to test out this theory, we uh, ran some experiments. So we looked at a data set of 30,000 freelancer resumes that were scraped from um, a major gig platform, namely Indeed. And this is a multi-class, multi-label uh, classification problem where the goal is to predict up to 10 skills in the software um, IT sector based on the resume. And we use a bert like text transformer model that's fine tuned for uh, five epochs. And the strategy that we use is we insert a unique formatting symbol, namely a very unique type of dash every 20 words. So we saw that the theory said if the signal is very unique, then our success uh, should be high. And for evaluation, we measure the frequency of the target label Y star on the test set where we insert this dash. So this is basically directly analogous to the definition of uh, success that I showed previously. And we consider both top one and uh, top 10 accuracy. So I'll show plots for both top one and uh, top 10. Okay, so this is what we observe for the feature label strategy. We can see that actually surprisingly few resumes are needed for the success to basically shoot up to one. So success occurs at around 0.1% of the data. So that's about 30 resumes. So this is extremely effective. And from left to right, you're just seeing uh, the results for a different, for a different target class uh, Y star. And um, the bottom row is for top 10 accuracy, the bottom, the top row is top 10 accuracy, the bottom one is uh, uh, top one. For the feature only strategy, we uh, observe uh, a significantly slower success as expected because we're only allowed to manipulate the features. So here, um, depending on the exact setting, success occurs at around one to 10. Uh, percent of the data. So uh, we need significantly more data points, uh, significantly uh, larger collective to actually succeed. And so now we wanted to test out um, a couple of other predictions of the theory. So um, we saw that these were the lower bounds and we saw that uh, classifier suboptimality played a significant role, namely uh, the less our classifier learns, uh, the lower our successes. So we need the uh, classifier to learn as much as possible. And to test this, we vary the number of epochs for which we uh, train the model. And indeed we observe that as we increase the number of epochs, the success goes up, which makes sense because the classifier picks up more and more on the patterns and the data that uh, we support. Okay, so um, also in the feature only setting, we test this hypothesis of um, how much P matters. So we said that we need P to be large enough. We need Y star to be a sufficiently probable label um, for all data points. And so to test this, we randomized some fraction of the labels in our data to make Y star sufficiently plausible. So there can't be any label that is the right label with overwhelming probability. Um, and so again, we can see that as we increase the number of 
um, the fraction of randomized labels, success uh, goes up. Okay, so um, those are all the results that I wanted to show for optimal prediction. So now I, I just want to briefly overview um, what we look at in the context of um, convex risk minimization. So here we're assuming that the firm chooses a model from uh, a parameterized set. Um, and it chooses this model according to risk minimization. So uh, it solves risk minimization over P, where again, recall P is this mixture distribution composing of, of the base distribution and the collective. And we're assuming that this uh, loss function L is uh, convex. And so here a natural success measure is just the distance to some target model theta star. So if you think about the learner as solving something like linear regression or uh, logistic regression, then entries of theta basically correspond to some kind of measure of feature importance. So you can think of this theta star as encoding which features we want to be uh, more important in our uh, predictions. Okay, and so informally we show that there exists a strategy that exactly achieves this um, theta star for a collective size that's upper bounded by uh, something proportional to the norm of the gradient of theta star on the base distribution. So just to think about why this should make sense. So if theta star uh, has very large gradient of P zero, that means that that theta star is very suboptimal on the distribution that we started from. And if it is very suboptimal at the beginning, then naturally we need a large collective to actually force the learner to go to theta star. On the other hand, if theta star has a small gradient at the beginning on the initial distribution, that means that even a priori theta star wasn't too suboptimal, which means that we need a smaller alpha to force the learner to go to that um, theta star. Sorry, does this mean your loss has to be like very like, I'm just trying to, like, we want some bound of this yeah. magnitude of the gradient for this to be a fraction, right? Uh, yeah. For it to be non backwards Yeah, so, so there, you need to be able to, yeah, I think maybe it'll be easier to explain offline. So it depends on how uh, large of a gradient you can induce by picking the distribution strategically. So you need to be able to uh, pick your distribution P star that will make this gradient go in a certain direction and be of a large enough magnitude. So this is divided by how large you can make that magnitude. So yeah, the, the result is uh, scalar variant. Um, yeah. It is constructive. I think just for simplicity, you didn't want to put it up on the slide. Um, yeah. And does it, is it a feature and label strategy or like? Yeah, it's just a, a strategy over Z. So we don't oh, think see. about, yeah, what Z consists of. It consists of features and labels, but in general, it's just some distribution for Z that is chosen in a way so that these gradients go in a certain direction. And sometimes you can achieve that by just choosing X. If you think about a setting like linear regression, basically it's just saying you can pick X to go in any direction, but it really depends on the exact setting. Okay, so, okay, so just to briefly wrap up. So um, I told you about a theoretical model that we proposed um, that uh, aims to capture a collective interacting with the firm's um, learning algorithm. Uh, we characterize the collective success rate in achieving its goals uh, as a function of the collective size alpha. We observed both theoretically and empirically that small collectives can indeed be um, very powerful. And I think that there are many questions to explore in the future in this framework. I think we're only really scratching the surface. Uh, for example, all the results that I told you about assume that there is already a collective in place. Um, but it would really be interesting to understand how collectives form in the first place, because uh, joining a collective may not necessarily be individually rational, uh, since all of a sudden you have to optimize for a larger group rather than uh, just your own self. So it would be interesting to understand the dynamics of uh, how collectives form in the first place. 
Um, I also haven't really touched upon this question of what happens if the population is heterogeneous. So we assume that there is an IID sample from the population that joins the collective. But in reality, there are some individuals that have a higher leverage, some individuals have lower leverage. So can the collective somehow exploit these higher leverage individuals uh, to uh, achieve success for maybe a smaller alpha? So um, with that, I want to thank you and happy to take any questions. The, the algorithm trying to be robust in this sense to these kind of uh, small groups like 0 0.1% or some tiny groups trying to change the levels? Yeah, so we haven't thought about it. Actually, the way we kind of started working on this is we felt that there was a lot of emphasis on this other side on robustifying algorithms and perhaps not as much focus on uh, on what people can do to improve their own welfare and utility and social um, on online platforms. Uh, so yeah, the short answer is no. I think this is maybe like an initial uh, step and then it will be very interesting to understand what if both sides are aware of the strategic incentives and both sides are trying to take those into account and like plan through the other side's um, algorithms. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you talk it was super interesting. I was just wondering when you had the um, experiments with the optimal algorithm there were differences I, I'm sorry if I missed it there were differences among how many examples it took for uh, you to reach the target prediction is this because like one of those outputs was more preferable than another and it was harder for the model like, it was one of them you said it was resume screening so it was one of them like this is definitely a good resume it should be forwarded onwards etc was there do, do you know any do you have any ideas to the reason behind they were why, why there was more um, examples necessary for one than another? Basically? You're talking about um, more examples we needed from left to right or between this slide left and the next right. slide? Left yeah. to right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I guess that, um, yeah, I'm not sure that I have the right answer to this. My guess would be that. Uh, some predictions are just closer to being optimal and so it takes less uh manipulation to make those predictions actually optimal but is there a difference like is the is target class zero like this is a bad resume and one this is an okay resume and two this is a good resume or oh no these different classes just correspond to different skills so we want different skills to be included in the prediction uh given a resume okay, okay. yeah so so yeah there's no like hierarchy between uh zero and one Great. I think that's